Mom, 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 seriously, I'm trying to make a video. Can you give me one minute? Oh, let's try this again. Hi, and welcome to the Spring Hill Equine Seminar. If you're new, like me, don't worry, it's gonna be fun. We'll give everyone a chance to grab some food and get comfy, and then we'll get started. Mom, I'm working here. You're always embarrassing me. Okay, I think we're about ready to go. All right, I have word from the tower that we're live. So hello everyone in Facebook land and YouTube. Wanna welcome you to tonight's seminar. We're gonna to start tonight's seminar with a very special guest speaker. And she's a special guest speaker because after tonight, she's no longer a guest, she's a permanent resident. So let me introduce Dr. Spizak. She is the newest member of the Spring Hill Equine team and she's gonna give us all a little bit of a heads up about who she is, what she does and what she loves. Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Spizak. I'm a UF grad that just joined the Spring Hill team. Um, some of you may have seen me. I've been hanging around all throughout vet school riding along with Dr. Latcher. Um, I'm a mixed animal veterinarian, so I'm super excited to be able to see dogs and cats, goats and sheep, cows, as well as the horses that we're all very used to. Um, so I'm excited to be part of the team. I'm riding with Dr. Latcher for the moment, but um, you can definitely get on my schedule for all of the creatures. All right, and if you wanna learn more about Dr. Spizak, you can go on our website, you can go on our Facebook page for sure, or you can follow her. She has a very active social media presence of Sarah Beth, the mixed animal vet. Sarah Beth, the mixed animal vet, and that is on Facebook and Instagram. So if you wanna find out all you ever wanted to know and completely Facebook stalker, you can do that. So again, Sarah Beth, the mixed animal vet. But we're actually here tonight to talk about one of the things that I absolutely hate to see as a veterinarian, and that is the viruses caused by mosquitoes. And one of the reasons we're doing this seminar is that recently we've seen a couple of cases and they're just heartbreaking for us. So let's talk a little bit about what these are. We call these arboviruses and they are any virus that needs a mosquito to be transmitted. The big ones that we see in horses are Eastern equine encephalitis and West Nile virus. But you may have heard of others, including in our vaccine, we commonly have Western equine encephalitis. It happens, it's pretty rare, but it's a combo pack in the vaccine with Eastern and West Nile. The other one that is out there is Venezuelan equine encephalitis. This virus is mostly located in South America. It is not endemic to the United States and there haven't been any outbreaks of this in the United States recently. In Florida, because we're special, we breed lots of mosquitoes and we love our mosquito-borne viruses. We have some other things that aren't, they're not quite as well classified. So they're suspected to exist, but we don't really have kind of a hard number on them and how they work in horses. So there's probably a variant of St. Louis encephalitis, which causes disease in horses that gets called uh, Everglades encephalitis because you can imagine where there's a lot of mosquitoes down in the Everglades, uh, this virus is seen. And essentially these horses present very similar to the other encephalitises, but when we do the, the testing, they come up negative. Uh, and even down to if sections of the brain or spinal cord are looked at under the microscope, they 
will commonly look like an encephalitis. And so that's why the virologists of the world really feel like we have some variants in Florida that are unique to us. There's some others that happen as in humans, and those are Japanese encephalitis, like I said, St. Louis encephalitis, uh, and I just forgot the name of the other one. Oh my goodness, Zika is a common mosquito-borne virus. Those guys do not happen in horses that we know of, but it's that we know of. In the Southern Hemisphere in, hemisphere in Australia, there is a virus called Kunjin, and that is actually a variant of West Nile. So just because you aren't in the United States doesn't mean that you aren't susceptible to these. And in fact, West Nile virus has been making bigger and bigger incursions into Europe. So no matter where you are, you need to be aware of these viruses. The big ones that we see in horses are Eastern equine encephalitis and West Nile virus. Those are the big, big, big deals. And they're the main ones that we form our vaccine schedules off of. So how do these viruses work? Like, where do they come from? Where do they go? So they, they mostly hang out in birds and mosquitoes around areas of water. So the birds hold on to the virus and they replicate it in very high levels. But for most birds, it doesn't make them sick. Now, if you're a little bit old like me and you remember when West Nile virus came through in 2001, then you remember that one of the things we saw was that a lot of crows were dying. And that's because West Nile virus was a new virus that crows in this country had never seen. So that's why we saw that massive die off. We don't really tend to see die offs like that anymore from these viruses. But if you notice a lot of dead birds on your property, it's definitely worth gathering them up and talking to your county extension service and seeing if they can help you identify some place to have those birds go. So normally you've got birds at water sources, you've got mosquitoes at water sources. The two of them are are the mosquitoes are biting the birds, the, giving them the virus, and then another mosquito comes along and bites it, you get the same thing kind of happen. So you just get this cycle of the two of them ramping up virus loads. If we are having a little bit of a drought going on, that's when we really worry about these because you've got all of your birds and all of your mosquitoes in very constricted spaces. So you have the opportunity for the virus to just in those populations. Then rainy season comes somewhere around June 1st and all of a sudden you have water everywhere. And now those birds and mosquitoes can disperse throughout the area. And they're taking with them really high loads of encephalitis virus. So when we see drought conditions, like we commonly see in the spring here in Florida, followed by a sudden onset of rain, which usually happens around June 1st, that's when we often start to see cases appear. And that's why, is that we've got everybody together ramping up and then it goes out into the wild. So there we've got my cute little arrows of how that normally works is that it normally goes through birds and mosquitoes. Sometimes though, as we're talking about, horses get affected as do humans. So yes, you can get encephalitis too. Just so you know, there's not a, a vaccine for humans, unlike for horses. We are, we and horses alike are what they call dead end hosts. We can't spread the virus to anything else. We can get it and we can get symptoms of it, but we don't generate enough of the virus in our system for a mosquito to be able to bite us, get virus, and then go to someone else and bite it. And the same is true for horses. So just because you have a horse on a property that has Eastern encephalitis, it doesn't mean that that horse spreads it to others, but it does mean that you have positive Eastern encephalitis mosquitoes on your property. So any other horse on your property is susceptible because they could have been bit by that same mosquito. We're gonna go over this again, because I hear this a lot. Horses and humans cannot transmit the virus to anyone else. Dead end host, that's what that means. Once the virus is in us, it's a one-way ticket, which is not a good plan if you're a virus. That's not their goal. Their goal is to actually replicate in an animal and then move on to other things. If you think about like COVID that we all have intimate knowledge of, you, the virus wants to get into you, replicate, and then you are the vehicle with which it spreads to other things. And so that's how a virus wants to work. 
we shouldn't get infected and neither should horses. So it's an accident of mother nature. What happens when we see a horse that has one of these diseases? They all have very similar things. And it's that the brain is under the weather. It's the, the virus goes into the cells that line the brain and spinal cord. And then the immune system comes into that area to attack the virus and causes swelling of the brain and spinal cord. So you really have a brain that's not working well. Eastern equine encephalitis is also commonly called sleeping sickness because these horses are often really sleepy. We'll go look at them. And even if they're a quiet horse, they'll be standing in the stall and they'll just, they'll just have their head just hanging there. It's a really great word we call obtunded. It's one of my favorite medical words, that and gubernaculum. Um, but obtunded means inappropriately kind of mentally lethargic. So it's not that they don't, they are tired because like say they're anemic or something along those lines. It's that their brain is literally not able to process stimulus appropriately. And so they're just not, they're not with it. But they're also at the same time inappropriately reactive. Like this, this is my favorite horse picture of all time, this horse in the beach. But so they're inappropriately reactive usually to sounds. So these are horses who'll be standing in the stall. They've got their head hung down. They look absolutely miserable. And then you clap outside the stall and they freak out for a moment. I mean, they will, they will hurt you because they're not, again, they're not mentally appropriate. And so they don't respond correctly to stimuli. You'll have a loud sound like that and they lose it for a moment. It's usually in the neighborhood of 15 to 20 seconds, and then they come back around. These horses nearly universally have a very high fever as well. Eastern encephalitis has a higher fever than West Nile, and those are the two common ones we see. So Eastern encephalitis is normally in the 103, 104 range Fahrenheit. They have very, very, very high fevers. The West Niles are often in the 1025, low 103 range. So it can be, there's overlap, but typically the West Niles run a little cooler than the Easterns. They, they have really, really, really high fevers. This is a horse that has a pretty common West Nile symptom, and that is the twitching. So if you look here, you'll see that this horse's muzzle is twitching quite a bit. Very, very, very typical of West Nile horses to see that just kind of twitching all over. And it usually starts on the nose and then progresses up the face and sometimes will progress down the rest of the horse. But very, very, very typical that the first thing you see is this twitching on the nose. Um, so when we see that along with uh, a mild fever, the first thing I'm going to ask you is what is your horse's vaccine history and have they been vaccinated in the last six months? So we're the, the thing about all of these symptoms and all of these is that signs progress very rapidly. For instance, in the ones we saw recently, the owners reported that the night before we saw them, they were just not right. You know, like they were just, they were a little spookier than normal, but also just too quiet and just not right if you knew them. But they all say like, doc, if you didn't know them, you'd probably think they were fine. But I've been around this horse and it's just not being right. By the next morning, we typically have horses who are stumbling. Um, you'll see them leaning against things to keep themselves upright because they can't stand up on their own. And then you'll start to see them be more and more and more uncoordinated. They also progress very quickly to being more obtunded. Again, I, I just love that word. That's why I just keep saying it. They progress to being more and more just, I mean, like we've seen them standing in the stall and they look like, you know, if we've ever had to do a procedure with even more sedation than a dental, like where we've had to really, really, really schnocker them, their nose is almost touching the ground. Like these horses are incredibly sedate. And then, uh, like I can remember one we had here, the door to the clinic opened and it's not a loud door and she lost it. She, she actually took out both water buckets in the stall and did that in about 15 seconds, and then instantly went back to standing in the corner with her head nearly touching the ground. So they go through these cycles, and the cycles get 
worse and more frequent before they eventually progress to being down and they're unable to stand. The worst part about these diseases is that from there, they often progress to seizures. And once these horses are having seizures, it is incredibly difficult to get near them to euthanize them. And that's really the only treatment option we have, which we're getting to. But this is why if your horse is experiencing anything remotely like the stumbling, uncoordinated, or leaning, I say call us immediately. <laughs> because again, if these guys progress to the point where they're having seizures, nearly impossible for us to safely euthanize them. This is also the big deal about encephalitis. Is. For Eastern encephalitis, it is a 96 to 97% mortality rate. So that means that most of them die. 97 out of 100 cases die. Not even like, can we get them to recover? It's that they die. And this has been my experience in unvaccinated horses in the practice in the last 20 years, is that if you have not been vaccinated, the chances are good. I'm not gonna be able to save you no matter what I do. The worst part though is if we can save them, which we can often do with West Nile horses, they aren't usually as badly affected, we can't get them back to normal. With neurologic horses, no matter what type it is, we always say that if you go to their worst, we can improve them one grade and we grade them on a scale from one to four. So if they are down and unable to stand and we're able to save that horse from the disease, that's a level four we're gonna be able to get them back to a level three, which is stumbling around the stall. And that is a horse that is no longer able to be an athlete. And in some cases can't even safely be out in a field as a, a pasture ornament and have a great retirement. So this disease, these diseases can be career ending even if they aren't life ending. So again, West Nile, we don't have the high mortality rate. It's, it's low down around 50%. So it's still a flip of a coin if the horse lives or not. But if they do, very, very rarely can we get those horses back to competition. There are some treatments we can do. You'll see not really much of a slide on it. That's because we don't have great ones. They're mostly supportive. We do some voodoo. Sometimes we give them DMSO because it smells bad and maybe it works. But honestly, none of what we do is a great treatment option. We can put them on some anti-inflammatories like banamine. Some of them we give steroids. We do a lot of supportive care, but for the most part, we're just trying to see, can we keep the horse going while we wait for the system to manage the virus that we have? So I'd rather talk about prevention because it is 99.99% .99 effective. And it is a simple vaccine. It has a very, very, very low reaction rate. The worst reactions we see to this are typically very mild sore necks that last for maybe 24 hours and off they go. Like in terms of the vaccines we give, this thing is safe, it's effective, it's, it's all the things we want in a vaccine. It's even pretty darn economically priced. However, most of the time, I see that it is not given often enough. If you live in Florida, and this is part of what we do with our wellness program, this vaccine needs to be given every six months. You don't get to skip to six and a half or seven months. It needs to be given every six months. And the reason for that in Florida is that we have positive mosquitoes every month of the year. So our horses are exposed to this virus on a very regular basis. You can't ever say, oh, it's cold out. We're not going to have mosquitoes this month. We live in Florida. Who hasn't been bit by a mosquito on Christmas Day? It happens all the time. If you are a younger horse, so under three years old, we like to give that vaccine every four months. For one, younger horses are more susceptible to these viruses. So we want to make sure they have good protection. And for two, their immune system doesn't respond as well to the vaccines as we'd like them to. I mean, horses are horrible vaccine responders as it is, but then add younger horses onto it. And we've really got to amp up the frequency of our vaccines to make sure that they're fully covered. So less than three years old, we recommend every four months. For everyone else, we recommend every six. And then in an opposite turn of events from the way most people think it should work, 
once horses are older, they're having an immune system compromise. We may talk about increasing vaccine frequency again, because again, horses are horrible vaccine responders. We wish that they would have better immunity to our vaccines. So they wane their immunity. And so we may need to increase vaccines back to every four months. Baby horses. The key to your baby horses, and, and again, one of the reasons we're talking about baby horses is they are not immune to this disease at any me by any means. And I'm talking about the ones that are on the sides of mares. We have had them affected as young as three months. The best prevention is to vaccinate your mare for these viruses about a month before she's due to full. By doing that, you're giving her really good immunity through the colostrum to go to the baby. And that's going to protect that foal until they're about three to four months old. At four months old, we start vaccinating ones from mares who have not had appropriate vaccines. And at about five months, we start doing babies that have had vaccines from well, or have ha had well vaccinated moms. Because they haven't been vaccinated before, we're going to do the vaccine. And then we're going to come back again in three to six weeks and do the vaccine again. And then we're going to come back again in three to four months and do it. Typically, the way that works for us is we end up doing the vaccine on the full we do a booster. And then when we're on the farm in the fall, doing everybody's vaccines anyway, we'll usually get the foal in again. And so they get that extra one for that year. And then they're super well protected from encephalitis. And again, if you're less than three years old, we strongly recommend that you get vaccinated every four months. Whew. Managing mosquitoes. Oh, hold on. We've got a question. Huh. I, so the question is, what about Texas and the lower part of the country? I recommend if there is a hint of a mosquito, so think about when you're giving your vaccines, right? So I always have to April, May, June, July, August, and October. So April, October, right? Like, let's say that, right? If you're in Texas, at least where I was in Texas, you could have a mosquito in April and you could dang sure have a mosquito in October. So I would absolutely vaccinate every six months. The other place that people get caught with vaccines now that someone brought that up, and I see this being in Florida, I see it a lot. People come down to the horse shows from up north and their horses are not vaccinated twice a year. They're only vaccinated once a year because they live in Michigan and maybe that makes sense up there. It does not make sense if your horse comes to Florida for horse shows in the fall or any temperate area of the country. You want to make sure that you're adding that additional time of vaccine in order to make sure that your horse is protected for the area they're going. And we veterinarians, despite our best efforts, are not clairvoyant. So you got to help us out with that and say, hey, I'm planning to go to Florida to horse show because I hear that World Equestrian Center is really cool, which it is. You should come visit. But I need to make sure my horse is well vaccinated for what's there. What should I do? Again, rhino and flu are commonly thought of when you're going to a horse show. But coming to Florida out of a northern area, you definitely want to add in another encephalitis. Because trust me, we have mosquitoes in January. And again, we have mosquitoes that are positive for encephalitis every month of the year. One of the ways that we know that we have positive mosquitoes, going to go down a little rabbit hole here. Um, this is one of the websites that I go to on a fairly regular basis because I'm a bit of a nerd about some of these diseases. But the Florida Arthropod Surveillance Site will show you in Florida, I'm sure other states have them as well, but will show you in Florida where we have positives for uh, Eastern Encephalitis, West Nile, Dengue, Chikungaya, and I think St. Louis. But anyway, you can go on that site and it will show you where we've got positives for all kinds of stuff. So do we have positive sentinel chicken flocks, which we'll talk about what those are in a second. Do we have positive humans? Do we have positive horses? One year, do we have positive emus? So we had a flock of emus here get affected by Eastern encephalitis one year. So the state of Florida has what we call sentinel chicken flocks positioned around the state. 
and weekly those chickens have a little bit of blood drawn off of them. Do not ask me how one draws blood from a chicken. Dr. Cop, who hangs out with us a couple of times a month, could probably do it because she does chickens, but me not so much. Um, no idea how you pull blood from a chicken. So those chickens are bled once a month, and then they're tested for these various viruses. So then we know as veterinarians, oh, we've got a positive sentinel chicken flock in Alachua County, which is where we are, in Alachua County, we know we've got Eastern encephalitis here because the chickens went positive. So there's no doubt about it. Now that information lags behind about three to six weeks, depending on some of the viruses. But, you know, so it's not always the most up to date. And in fact, commonly we'll have a sentinel chicken flock go positive and we'll see a horse in the same week. So, you know, it, it just gives us a good idea though of how much of it is out there and, and what's going on. So, Speaking of mosquitoes, <laughs> it is important to try to manage mosquitoes. Notice I have the laughing emoji here because if you live in Florida in the swamps, you know that managing mosquitoes is a futile effort, but some things we can try. Make sure that you don't have standing water in particular around the barn. So if you've got some place your horses are at for some period of day, like the barn or a sacrifice paddock, something like that, Make sure that you're either dumping your water troughs on a regular basis or that you know, you're, you're keeping those clean of mosquito larvae uh, and that you don't have lots of standing water around them to help minimize mosquitoes in that area. You can also bring horses in stalls under fans and mosquitoes don't particularly love being underneath fans. It's not their favorite place to be. So I always say, like, I would tell you that probably late evening, early morning, and then through the night is the worst for mosquitoes. So if you're trying to minimize mosquito exposure, you're going to put them in the barn at night. But we've all been bit by mosquitoes at noon in Florida. So not 100% of a great way to keep them away from them, but you can get less mosquito exposure. You can also do any of the 8 million different fly sheets out there. My personal favorite is the Schneider's Mosquito Mesh Fly Sheet. I find it's light enough that horses can wear it in Florida in the summer and be okay. They're going to be a little bit hotter than their counterpart, but they're going to be all right. You can also take those fly sheets and spray them with fabric permethrin spray, and that will help keep the mosquitoes away even a little bit better. So again, fabric permethrin spray available on Amazon. It's a great choice for these guys, but uh, the, the fly sheets can help you a bit. Uh, if you're riding and you want to keep fly, uh, mosquitoes away, you can go with a deep product on horses pretty safely and be all right. The, prob the holy grail of mosquito repellents is trying to find something that lasts for any length of time, and there just isn't anything. DEET lasts longer than about anything else on the market, but it's still only three to four hours. So if you're trying to keep mosquitoes away, reapplication on a frequent basis is really, really important. So like I said, attempting to manage your mosquitoes, but you know, like on, on my property, there's wet areas all around, you know, my neighbor has a pond, so there's, I'm not going to drain her pond so I don't have mosquitoes. So it can be extremely difficult. This is why vaccination is super, super, super important. So if you get nothing else out of this, please, please, please vaccinate for the encephalitis. These are incredibly deadly diseases. And if they aren't deadly, like West Nile, sometimes they are career ending for horses. They, so please use these very effective, very minimally reactive vaccines and make your veterinarian happy. Because the thing we like the least is to go out and see one of these horses and have to euthanize them when we know that they could have been saved with a, a simple, cheap, effective vaccine. So, do we have questions? Ah, the combo vaccines. So vaccines, the smallest combination available is Eastern, in the United States anyways, is Eastern encephalitis, Western encephalitis, and tetanus as a combination. There is a lot of sort of controversy on how we give vaccines um, and, and those big combinations. So 
there, there's really good work by the vaccine companies and FDA requires them to show that they get good titers when they put those into group vaccines. Now, if I have a horse that reacts, then I will do just the EWT. We can find just West Nile, but it's hard. I'll do just the West Nile a week later, and then we'll do any other vaccines separate. So basically we end up spreading those vaccines out and we'll often pre-medicate with a little bit of a non-steroidal. I find that the encephalitis vaccine is rarely the one they're reacting to. I also find that most of the time when owners go buy their own vaccines, they get the Eastern, Western, Tetanus, West Nile, and Venezuelan. And there hasn't been an outbreak of Venezuela in the United States since 1975. So the moral of that story, for a lot of reasons, is that you should have your veterinarian do your vaccines. We got anything else? Okay. So we have a question from the audience about the difference between the vaccines from like tractor supply or from us. And let's talk about that for a second. A couple of things happen when you buy vaccines from us and we administer them. And one is that they're backed by the company. So let's say that your horse is one of the 0.1% and that 99.9% .9 that do become affected even though they're vaccinated. The company that manufactured that vaccine is going to pay for treatment of that horse. So they are saying that because we administered it as a veterinarian, they will back that vaccine up and they won't do it from anyone else. And the reason that's the case, and this is where it's really important, the supply chain on vaccines from the manufacturer all the way to the point where we put it in is really, really, really important. They're incredibly temperature sensitive and they have to be maintained appropriately. The companies are also saying that we have, as veterinarians have evaluated your horse and said they're healthy enough to get the vaccine and respond appropriately. So I cannot emphasize enough that your vaccines should come from your veterinarian for all of these reasons and more. And you should have a great relationship with your veterinarian and that involves routine care. And we have another question from... Oh, can you tell from looking at a vaccine if it's been compromised? Does it have like a color change if the temperature got off or anything like that? Nope. An ineffective vaccine looks exactly the same as an effective vaccine. So, all right. Well, encephalitis is something that's very near and dear to our hearts. And so once again, if you guys will do anything for me, it's vaccinate your horses.